Peter wants to ask Jesus, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times, or 70 times seven. And that's found in Matthew 18, 21 to 22. So before I go on, I'll just share a little bit about my background. <clears throat> For those of you visiting or listening to this at a later time, my name is uh, Jacob Penner. I was born in Mexico, and at age six, my family moved to Canada. I'm the youngest of eight surviving children. So growing up, we were taught about God and heaven and hell. Uh, we went to an old colony church. But at age 15, I left that church because uh, I was searching for something different. God was starting to work inside me, and I wanted to know more about him, who God was, and what did it mean that Christ died for my sins. I could share my whole life story, but I, I want to focus on a small chapter in my life. Uh, my relationship with my dad was never a good one growing up. He was a, a very strict and angry man. When I was little, I was afraid of him, and as I got older, I resented him and even hated him sometimes. I, wanted, I won't get into the details on exactly why, but the abuse I went through had uh, long-lasting effects because of it. I never said anything to anyone, and for what I've seen from my siblings, no one spoke up or shared their feelings, so I just bottled it up and figured things would get better with time. As I got older, I became more distant and closed off from my parents. My dad and I would get into fights and I would leave or just be in my room listening to music. I learned that if I stayed clear, to, clear of my dad, we didn't fight as much. And when I was old enough to drive, I would just go away for a few days and not have to worry about anything going on at home. All this created a wall in my heart, inside me, that I didn't realize I was building at the time. Even though growing up the way I did, God was always working inside me. I never had the desire to do the things like some of my friends did, the partying, the drinking, those things. And I had a few Christian friends, and I seen how much happier they were. I think this is what uh, led me to an EMC youth group. At age 15, I started attending, attending the Leamington EMC and became a Christian at age 16. I didn't fully understand how forgiveness worked, but I knew Jesus had died for my sins and wanted to be forgiven of my sins. I tried to forgive all those who had hurt me in the past just as Christ had forgiven me because I wanted peace in my life and I didn't want to be angry anymore. In Ephesians 4, verse 31 and 32, it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another as Christ in, as God in Christ had forgiven you. I continued to grow as a Christian, and when I met my wife, I thought I had my past behind me. I was a different person. I was involved in church and seemingly happy. I didn't realize it, though. Slowly, my past was coming back in my life. And about seven years ago, I had to learn through a very difficult time what it meant to truly forgive someone. Some of the pain from my past had stayed with me and, and developed inside me. I had struggled for years, and eventually it came crashing. Sin had grabbed a hold of, my, a hold of me, and I didn't know how to get out. Sometimes God allows things to happen to show you a way out. That's exactly what he did to me. I had hurt the ones I loved and now wanted to be forgiven and make things right. I realized that if I was to be forgiven, I needed to fully forgive those who had hurt me. That meant confronting my dad and my past. 
By this time, my dad was a very different man. He was a much older, calm man. When I talked to him, he acknowledged the past, and I told him I forgave him, and I hoped that he could forgive himself as well. I had finally found that peace that God wanted for me. In Hebrews 8, verse 12, it says, For I, forg I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. When God forgives our sins, he doesn't remind us or even remembers them. If God can do that to my past, then I had to do the same with my dad and others. I know in our humanness, it's more difficult to do that. I have to remind myself daily that, I, that God has forgiven and not to believe Satan's lies. I also have to remember God has forgiven others so that I can't hold their past against them or judge them. I'm very thankful that Jesus died for my sins and I don't have to dwell on my past or the past of others. It wasn't easy getting to where I am today. I had to confide in others and let God do his healing. So I would encourage all of you to talk about your struggles to someone. Don't let them grow and make things more difficult down the road. God does forgive and offers peace that comes with it. So if you have undealt sin in your lives or whatever, struggles that you haven't dealt with. Like I was told once, it's better to deal with things here and now in this life than after it's too late. So make things right with whoever you sinned against and especially with Jesus. He wants a relationship with you. And he's just waiting for you to acknowledge him. When I became a Christian, I thought all you had to do was ask Jesus to forgive you. And I would do this over and over. And I know now that asking forgiveness is one thing, but you have to acknowledge who he is and what he did. This will give you peace about your past and restore your relationships. My favorite verse has always been, and I'll end with this, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jake, for sharing that. What an awesome testimony of reconciliation, uh, both the reconciliation between him uh, and his Savior, and also between him and his dad, and many other people in his life that he didn't go into detail sharing about, but I'm sure that's part of his story. So thank you, Jake, for sharing that. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So today we want to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. This event is so incredibly simple. This occasion is so simple, yet it's so meaningful especially for a Christ follower. This time is remembering the Passover in Egypt over 3,000 years ago when the death angel passed over all who had the blood of a sacrificed lamb painted on their doorposts. This time is also, remember, it's also about remembering that Jesus is the one that became that Passover lamb that would be sacrificed for the sins of the whole world. It's also a memorial service where Christians remember Christ's death and his suffering. It's also a celebration, celebrating our redemption as a result of that. It also reminds us that Christ is coming 
again. He will return. And as a result of that, the need to continually proclaim the gospel and the truth of who Jesus is until that time. So these are dimensions of communion that are commonly heard and talked about. But there are other, also other aspects of communion that I think are less talked about, but also worth exploring and thinking about. Communion is also an invitation and a reminder from the Father to prodigals to come home and have supper with him. Communion is an invitation from the king himself to sit at his table and not only eat with him, but also be served by him. This is, in essence, what Jesus illustrates with his disciples in that upper room when he participates in the Passover feast with his disciples. And it's not only an illustration of this, it's also the beginning of what we now call the Lord's Supper. Because Jesus himself, when he did this, and remember, Jesus is God, he's part of the Trinity, he prepared for and served and ate the supper together with his disciples, and then he said to them, going forward, do this in remembrance of me, what I'm about to do. So from that time on, it's about the Lord's Supper. I really appreciate the way Max Lucado frames this. He just has a way with words. So I'm just going to quote a bit of a lengthy section here from Max Lucado uh, where how he frames this Lord's Supper, and I think it's beautiful. He says this, For some, communion is a sleepy hour in which wafers are eaten and juice is drunk, but the soul never stirs. It wasn't intended to be as such. It was intended to be in, I can't believe it's me. Pinch me, I'm dreaming. Invitation to sit at God's table and be served by the king. When you read Matthew's account of the Lord's Supper, one incredible truth surfaces. Jesus is the person behind it all. It was Jesus who selected the place, designated the time, and set the meal in order. And at the supper, Jesus is not the guest, but the host. We read that he took, he blessed, he broke, he gave. Jesus is the most active one at the table. Jesus is not portrayed as the one who reclines and receives, but as the one who stands and gives. And he still does. The Lord's Supper is a gift to you and to me. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, not a sacrifice. Often we think of the Supper as a performance, a time when we are on stage and God is the audience. A ceremony in which we do the work and he does the watching. That's not how it was intended. If it was, Jesus would have taken his seat at the table and relaxed. That's not what he did. He instead fulfilled his role as a rabbi by guiding his disciples through the Passover. He fulfilled his role as a servant by washing their feet. And he fulfilled his role as a savior by granting them forgiveness of sins. He was in charge. He was on center stage. He was the person behind and in that moment. And he still is today. It is the Lord's table you sit at. It is the Lord's supper you eat. Just as Jesus prayed for his disciples, Jesus begs God for us. It's a holy invitation. A sacred sacrament begging you to leave the chores of life and enter his splendor. He meets you at the table. Think about that the next time you go to the table. End quote. God is inviting us 
to leave behind the chores, struggles, and distractions of life for a moment. I think for a lot more than just a moment, but at minimum for this moment. To come and eat at his table where he will serve us. He will refresh us and remind us that in him we have forgiveness. In him we are redeemed. In him we remember that he is coming again and when he does, he will ultimately save completely and he will make everything new. We have so much to praise God for. So this morning, as we want to participate in this celebration, the question is always arisen, uh, always arises as to who can participate in the Lord's Supper, this communion with Christ. When we look at 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul confronts the Corinthian church about misuses of the Lord's Supper. And in the misuses And for the sake of time, it's a lengthy portion. We're not going to read that section. But please grab your Bibles, open to 1 Corinthians 11. Check up on it at home later if you don't have your Bibles now. Keep me accountable. I appreciate that. But in 1 Corinthians 11, what he talks about, I'll just give a brief summary of what he says the misuses are. The misuse that they are doing when it comes to the Lord's Supper is that they are coming, and when they come, they're divided. There's conflict. They come to the Lord's Supper and they can't even get along. There's classifications of people between the rich and the poor. They were not waiting for each other. They were not eating together. Some were treating the Lord's Supper as a place to come to to pig out. There was gluttony. Some were using the Lord's Supper as an excuse to get drunk. This tells me they used real wine. The wealthy in the Corinthian church were overlooking the poor. This whole thing about classification. So Paul, in response to that, he gives a concise reminder of what the Lord's Supper is, verses 23 to 26, which I read already. And then he follows that by five ways to correct uh, those misuses, which you read in verses 27 through 34. And they're simply this. He says, do not eat and drink in an unworthy manner. So what does that mean? I think especially in the context of what Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, to eat and drink in an unworthy manner means to come in hypocrisy. It means that you're coming and you're fighting. There's division. You're not even seeing what this is all about because if you were, you wouldn't come, be coming to this occasion arguing. They were ignoring the poor. These are aspects of coming in an unworthy manner. He says, examine yourselves before participating. So in other words, what's your motive for coming? Do I want to be seen as walking with God on the outside, but actually am unwilling to be reconciled to my brother or sister? Maybe that's what the fights were. Maybe there were people in the church that weren't getting along, and they both wanted to participate in the Lord's Supper, but they couldn't even get along there. Maybe that's what it was. Do I care about the very things that the gospel of Jesus stands for, like justice, compassion, and generosity? Because to me, it's evidenced in this Corinthian church that they came together, not only were they fighting, but there was classifications between rich and poor. Remember, we're going through Ephesians, and it talks about that the gospel tears down dividing walls. That doesn't sound like the gospel, what the Corinthian church was doing, where there was a division between rich and poor. So examine yourselves. Paul says, discern the body of Christ. And I think this simply means to have an understanding of what it is that Jesus did on your behalf. Paul says, eat together. When you come, do it together. Wait for each other. And then finally, he says, if you're hungry, eat at home. Don't come with an empty stomach and just that your mind is just focused on, you know, maybe Paul was thinking about being hangry. I don't know. He says, don't come with the intention to eat a meal. Come and with the right motive. He says, eat at home first. So that, I have not really answered the question yet, so who can participate? I think those who discern the body of Christ. If you understand his sacrifice and sins, and you've received it. His sacrifice for sins, and you've received it. 
those who have examined their motives and can honestly come as a result of Jesus, and not because you're coerced by somebody else, or pressured, or feel like you have to, or feel like you have to to be in good standing with the church, or in, in the reputation or perception of your friends or family. Examine your motives. Those who can come in a worthy manner, but here we need to be very careful. I do not think this is talking about being good enough or somehow being self-qualified. This is talking about understanding that it is literally about Jesus. That's why we come. Were you good enough to be saved? Did you deserve for Jesus to die for you? This is no different. Taking part in an unworthy way is... I think the pride that leads people to thinking that they're good enough, which then leads to stuff like division, drunkenness, not caring about the poor. And I would venture to say that those are indications that people aren't really grasping the gospel. In many ways, baptism is the way that people declare that they belong to the family. In the Lord's Supper is the family meal that reminds the family who they are and that they belong to Christ and to each other and that we're adopted into that family. So for this reason, here at Stratford EMC, we have taught and we teach that communion um, is for baptized believers. However, we recognize that ultimately it's between each person and God. Each person must must examine themselves. Each person must on their own discern the body of Christ. And for those reasons, we don't withhold communion from anyone that wants to participate because it's between you and God. But the emphasis by us, and we believe by Scripture, is that it's that participants are believers. That's the emphasis. So if you desire to participate in the family meal, I think you should also desire to declare your allegiance to the family through baptism. 